Um, now, a number of questions uh, were made uh, uh, during uh, the debate, and I hope I've tried, to, I've tried to answer as many of those as I can. And one of those was around uh, BMHRA, which my honourable, uh, right honourable friend from Tatton touched on. And just to reassure, after the Julia Cumberledge uh, review, uh, first you know, harm was made, there has been significant uh, changes at the MHRA, and um, that you know, I am pleased that they did review the AstraZeneca um, vaccine and made uh, two changes to that based on their evidence, but also to give reassurance on other medicines as well. The MHRA have been significantly influential in the recent um, statutory instrument around the use of sodium valparate, which is used for women uh, mainly for epilepsy that can cause harm during pregnancy. And we have a, a number of pregnancies that happen with women on that drug. It was the MHRA that met with campaigning groups such as INFACT and have influenced that legislation to make sure that only sodium valparate uh, in manufacturers' original packaging so that women are aware of the risks um, can be dispensed. That is an example of how the MHRA is changing. Um, as uh, Dr. Jumaid said, they're not just a regulator now, they are part and parcel of the patient safety framework around uh, medicines, and I hope that gives um, some reassurance. Um, if she is concerned as I am, though, that the head of the MHRA has described it that the uh, pandemic. Um, COVID pandemic catalyzed the transformation of that regulator from watchdog, which it should be, to now an enabler. It's significantly shifted in its purpose. Uh, for um, for uh, Dr. Jumai in, in when she said that, but what I can say is that I take that from an enabler to be an enabler of patient safety, and the fact that they have stepped in in a number of cases, and I've just given an example with sodium valparate, uh, means that. Um, uh, that they are advocating for patient safety and not just um, someone who processes uh, a body that processes applications for clinical trials or um, uh, 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 kind of uh, runs the yellow card system. And so I would encourage people to, um, uh, and they're very willing to meet with a whole range of groups. And I think actually I did say at the All Party Parliamentary Group that to invite the MHRA to, to one of their meetings. Before I finish, Madam Deputy Speaker, I just want to touch on the issue of claims. Uh, we have uh, moved, as I've said in my speech, uh, the vaccine down payment scheme from the DWP uh, to NHS uh, BSA, um, and just uh, and that the, the point of that was to speed up the claims because the limiting factor in terms of turnaround time is around getting clinical notes, and NHS B BSA are much more uh, able to get um, access to clinical notes than the DWP. Um, we have introduced a subject access request so that we can just get one consent form to uh, get notes from a variety of sources from primary care through to secondary care. And just to update on the latest figures, as of the 6th of October, 7,574 claims have been made, uh, COVID claims uh, to a vaccine damage payment scheme. Um, of these, 3,593 have been processed, with 149 having received a payment. Um, and on average, it's taking around six months to investigate and process claims at the moment. Some will be outside of that because of difficulties getting their clinical records. But uh, the majority of... OK, so we'll finish it there. But uh, you can see it's a slow process. But you can claim for vaccine damage for the COVID vaccines as well as other vaccines. I'll finish with the Sir Christopher Chope. And particularly, is she pleased that the inquiry is going to be looking into whether or not the VDPS is fit for purpose?